Today, I will be talking about the contributions of Alexander Luria in neuropsychology. So what is neuropsychology? Clinical neuropsychology is the study of how complex properties of the brain allow behaviors to occur. Neuropsychologists study relationships between brain functions and behavior as it relates to normal and abnormal functioning of the central nervous system. It is a practice that requires flexibility, curiosity, inventiveness, and clinical empathy. The goals of current neuropsychological assessments do not only focus on the weaknesses or the presenting problem of the patient, but also focuses on the strengths and overall profile of the individual. Evidence of human interest in brain and behavioral relationships date back to 6500 BC. Archaeologists have discovered thousands of skulls with evidence of trephining, which was a surgical operation that involved cutting, scraping, chiseling, or drilling pieces of bone from the skull. Researchers are still debating the utility of trephining, but they have posited that it was used to relieve pressure from the skull due to brain swelling that was sustained from head injuries in wars or battles. Some investigators have also noted that it may have been used as a magical form of healing to rid the individual of bizarre behaviors that we would now currently recognize as epilepsy or schizophrenia. In the early 19th century, Austrian anatomist Franz Gall postulated that the brain consists of a number of separate organs, each responsible for basic traits such as courage, friendliness, or combativeness. He later formulated the localization theory of brain function and proposed the science of phrenology, a theory that proposes that if a given brain area is enlarged, then the corresponding area of the skull will also be enlarged via small bumps on the skull. And likewise, a depression in the skull would signify an underdeveloped trait. Feeling different bumps on the skull, maybe through a phrenology cap or another medical device, would help in predictions about a person's psychological strengths and someone's psychological weaknesses. In 1861, Paul Broca studied cortical localization and announced that motor speech was located in the posterior inferior region of the left frontal lobe. His work with his famous patient Laborne, along with his contributions, helped him understand the origins of aphasia, in which damage to the inferior region of the frontal lobe led to the inability to talk, which was consistent among multiple participants. With his findings, he proposed a localization of higher cognitive functions, that expressive speech is controlled by a specific brain area, which is now known as Broca's area. Broca also helped spearhead the notion of a separation of functions between the left and right hemispheres, in which the different hemispheres of the brain would control different behaviors. For an example, language would be localized to the left hemisphere, whereas the right hemisphere would be more involved with nonverbal non behaviors. After a decade um, of Broca's di discovery, Carl Wernicke announced that the understanding of speech was located in the superior posterior aspects of the temporal lobe, thus highlighting and reinforcing this localization of cognitive functions. Damage to this part of the brain, which now is now known as Wernicke's area, will result in Wernicke's aphasia and the inability to understand speech. By the turn of the 20th century, new psychologists started to challenge these findings and challenge the localization theory. Pierre Marie challenged Broca's findings and the strictness of localization theory by examining the brains of his patients. He found that his patient, Le Bourne, had widespread damage of the brain not just solely a lesion in Broca's area. The damage to the brain caused dramatic loss of intellect rather than just specifically the ability to speak. Researchers began to understand that although basic sensory motor functions may be localized to the brain, higher cortical processes were too complex to confine to one cortical area. Carl Lashley, who was a student of John Watson, also accepted the localization of basic sensory and motor skills. However, he found that impairment was related to the amount of cortex removed and that the specific area removed made little difference. He proposed the mass action principle, which was the extent of behavior impairments is directly proportional to the mass of the removed tissue. He also just suggested that each part of the brain participates in more than one function. Hewlings Jackson proposed that one does not have a speech center, but has the ability to combine certain basic skills such as hearing, discrimination of sounds, to, complex, to create more complex and higher skills. 
Loss of speech or mental functioning can be due to the loss of any one of these basic abilities. He proposed that behavior results from interactions among all these areas of the brain, not just only that sole cortical area. Even motor movements require cooperation of all levels of the nervous system, the peripheral nervous system, and the cerebral hemispheres. The loss or damage of a specific area of the brain causes the loss or impairment of all higher skills dependent on that one area. A lesion that causes the loss of speech does not necessarily indicate that the brain area is completely responsible for speech is found. Behavior results from interactions among all the areas of the brain. So with this new mindset, a search for brain damage began to focus on finding sets of tests of different functions that would help differentiate someone with brain damage and normal patients. One of the most novel test batteries that was created to diagnose organic brain damage was the Hunt Minnesota test for organic brain damage, which was made in 1943, which included the 1937 version of the Stanford Binet vocabulary test and six tests of learning and retention which was considered to be sensitive to brain deterioration. Scientists believe that this test could help identify brain damaged people in under 15 minutes. Alexander Luria was born in Kazan, an old town east of Moscow in 1902. He was the son of a prominent physician who was interested in psychosomatic disorders and a mother who was a dentist. He entered the Kazan University at the age of 16 and obtained his degree in 1921 at the age of 19. During his time at Kazan University, he became active in a student scientific society, where he was fascinated with the works of Wundt, Titchener, and Ebbinghaus, and had reached out and made contact with Freud. In 1921, he continued his education in the medical department of Kazan University. During the period from 1937 to 1941, Luria worked at the neurological clinic of the Institute of Experimental Medicine as head of the lab Laboratory of Experimental Psychology with a focus on understanding different types of aphasia. His work really began in the beginning of World War II, where he organized a base neurosurgical hospital where he was able to work with brain-damaged soldiers that suffered from various forms of traumatic brain injuries, which provided him with a lot of large collection of data. He used the data to begin developing theories of brain function and methods for me remediation of focal brain lesions. He wrote papers on the diagnoses and treatment of penetrating gunshot wounds to the head and developed a theory of rehabilitation of patients with brain damage. It was during this period where he developed a systematic approach to brain cognition, now known as neuropsychology. Following the war, Luria continued his work in neuropsychology, which he pursued until his death of heart failure in 1977. He published multiple articles and published several books on his works, including Traumatic Aphasia in 1959, The Working Brain, An Introduction to Neuropsychology in 1973, The Mind of a Nemonist in 1968, and The Man with the Shadow Shattered World, The History of a Brain Wound in 1972. His work in neuropsychology continued to influence many fields of medicine and cognitive science, as well as prominent scientists and neuropsychologists, such as Oliver Sacks. Luria is often noted as the father of modern neuropsychological assessment through his notable contributions to the area of neuropsychology. The science of neuropsychology established by Luria focuses on the functional structure and brain organization of higher mental functions, which is consistent with Hugh Jackson's theory. Human mental processes represent complex functional systems that involve groups of brain areas working together in concert, each making a contribution to the organization of a full functional system. He also proposed a vertical hierarchical organization. In neuropsychology, Luria emphasized the importance of breaking down complex mental and behavior functions into each individual component parts. Luria also focused on a qualitative analysis based on observing and analyzing the structure of each task, the types of errors that are produced, and the overall behavior of the patient. He stressed the value of careful qualitative analysis of cognitive behavioral systems to be used together with quantitative psychometric instruments. Luria also proposed a central theory that states that human development is a complex process that must be framed within a social, cultural, and historical context. The totality of an individual skill and habit significantly modulates and affects the development of cognitive skills. This idea is still being wrestled with by neuropsychologists to this day, where efforts are being made to understand cultural and personal factors that may 
affect neuropsychological performance and outcomes. Luria conceived each area in the central nervous system as being involved in three basic units. The first unit, which was roughly defined as the brainstem and associated areas, regulates arousal levels of the brain and the maintenance of proper muscle tone. The second unit, which includes the posterior areas of the cortex, plays a key role in the reception, integration, and analysis of sensory information. And lastly, the third unit, which includes the frontal and prefrontal lobes, is involved in planning, executing, and verifying behavior, very much in executive functioning. He proposed that all these behaviors are required the interaction of these three basic units in a vertical organization plan. Luria formulated the concept of functional systems which represent the pattern of interaction among the various areas of the brain necessary to complete a certain behavior. Each area in the brain operates in conjunction with other areas of the brain, and no area of the brain is singly responsible for any voluntary human behavior. Thus, each area of the brain may play a specific role in many and multiple behaviors. Finally, Luria also proposed a concept of neuroplasticity, where higher level brain skills can compensate for lower level skills and in brain injuries. This idea, as well as his previous theories, suggests ways to establish rehabilitation and treatment programs for brain-injured patients and provide a strong basis for the understanding of clinical neuropsychology. With the contributions of Luria, many neuropsychologists in the mid to late 20th century started to create neuropsychological batteries to administer to different clinical populations. Early tests utilizing Luria's materials were organized into 10 different sections according to specific functions including motor functions, acoustical motor organization, higher kinesthetic functions, higher visual functions, receptive speech, expressive speech, writing and reading, arithmetic skills, nestic processes, and investigation of intellectual processing. Some of these early neuropsychological assessments also included a six-point scoring system to capture some of the qualitative features of patient performances and patient behaviors, which was also mentioned by Luria, which was to combine quantitative and qualitative data in understanding a person. The Luria Nebraska Neuropsychological Battery was created in 1985 to test for these different neuropsychological domains. However, there were some errors and significant psychometric problems that were found with this test. Another main problem was that the test did not test for memory, which is often compromised in multiple clinical populations. Many neuropsychologists found this battery to be unreliable, which contributed to its absence in peer-reviewed journals. However, neuropsychologists were not disheartened by the unreliability and the failure of this test, but began creating and polishing new neuropsychological batteries that are influenced by the theories of Luria, which was to provide a valid and reliable way of measuring cognitive and ba brain behavior relationships. Cultural and social considerations, which were also mentioned by Luria, are issues that are constantly being addressed in neuropsychology to this day. Different batteries and additions with reliable and valid properties are created to tailor toward these different cultural populations. Lira was able to create a framework and a backbone for the future of neuropsychology. He was able to create a framework in which current neuropsychology is evolving to better understand cognitive processes and brain behavior relationships. Here are my references that I used for this presentation as well as the picture URLs. Thank you very much.